to represent. One of the things we haven't been able to talk about here was doing something to Birmingham Bobs. Now you might think sort of the Birmingham Bobs, that was the provost. What has that got to do with the state? How can you blame the state? Oh yes we can. Blame the state. Sorry for what happened at Birmingham. That doesn't excuse the provost. It was a despicable, cowardly act to plant a bomb on a Friday night when people in the centre of Birmingham were just out for a, 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 a night's entertainment and to enjoy themselves. One of the people blown to bits a 17-year-old, Maxine Hamilton. 17 years old. I thought she'd blown to bits, started on a pub, started, uh, uh, in, in, in her hometown. But what happens afterwards? I was talking the last couple of days, as I talked last year, to her sister, Joan Hamilton. And when I wanted Joan to come over and speak at the bloody Sunday weekend, and Kate will remember us discussing this and saying that would be terrific. Get her over. You want to hear Joan Hamilton talking started, about the police, about the courts. No Irish Republican can talk with such passion about the damage done to their families, the damage done to the truth, and the damage done to justice or by the courts and the establishment as relatives of the Birmingham bomb victims kept. Because what they have discovered is that they were lied to over and over and over again. They were told, we got the guys who did that, six of them, led by Paddy Hill, the Birmingham Six, they are guilty, even after they were released, having proven that they were innocent. The cops were still telling them and the Home Office, and the press, were all telling us those guys really did it. They got out on a technicality. It wasn't until some of them met Paddy Hill. Joan Hamilton told me herself that she had been looking for documents, <laughs> that had been looking for the evidence and the papers and the case. Couldn't get them from anybody. Home Office told her they didn't exist. The cops said, no, we have no records of any of this. She didn't get enough she was talking to Paddy Hill. And she talked to Paddy Hill with great reluctance, great reluctance. This was the man she had been told and her family had been told was the OC, the officer commanding, the bombing unit that committed those murders. So she didn't want to talk. But finally, when she said to Paddy Hiller in his presence that she couldn't get these documents, they couldn't find the documents which would tell the truth, he suddenly checked them and said, I've got them. I'll give them to you. He had them under discovery at his trial. So when the, the, the prosecution had to turn them over. Paddy went down to London the next day, came back with a big cardboard box full of papers, knocked at the Hamilton store, said, there you are, that's what you were looking for. She told me, she says, at that moment, I realized how the truth had been hidden from us. She also said, she says, I realized that Paddy Hill is a great man. Imagine that, that Paddy Hill is a great man. So I one of the relatives at the birth, now, that was withheld, all that truth was withheld from the relatives because the police and the special branch had agents within the IRA that they wanted to, uh, to protect. So they lied. And the fact, the fact that you have 21 working class English people have been blown to bits meant nothing to them. As long as they had to protect their informers. As long as they had to protect sort of the secret agents that they had controlling and manipulating people. The same pattern exists in all these cases that we've, that, uh, uh, that we've heard. None of it is accidental. All of it is planned. And the conclusion that I draw from it, and I believe you all should draw from it, is that these aren't individual examples of injustice. This is an example of something that happens not just all the time in England. It's not just sort of the English ruling class and English justice, as the terror relation to uh, the start of. The Irish ruling class is as rotten as anybody else. Tell you about the Irish ruling class on Bloody Sunday. You go around now and ask them in Webster House, ask the leaders of all the major parties about Bloody Sunday. Terrible thing. Terrible thing, that bloody song. Absolutely shocking. Those people deserve the truth, etc., etc. They weren't fucking saying that for 30 years when delegations were going down from Derry, pleading with them. Do you something about it? I can remember they went, Mary Robinson, great liberal woman, president of Ireland, refused point blank to meet the bloody Sunday relatives on a number of occasions until they went down with placards and stood outside her residence in Phoenix Park until she agreed that they could come in and say a few words. I went down, I don't know if you were there, kid, to have to launch a book about bloody Sunday in Boswell's Hotel, opposite the dock, some years ago. And we invited every single TD. They're just across the street in Leicester House to come along and help us to launch this book. One turned up, Tony Gregory. The late Tony Gregory, independent TD for Dublin Centre. Nobody else showed their face. They didn't want to know. And the reason they didn't want to know is that they thought that the Bloody Sunday case had the potential to disrupt Anglo-Irish relations. And they were right. 
that of course I must see that Kate does that at the after the Savile Tribunal published its report that David Cameron got up in the Parliament and said that the shooting of these people had been unjustified and unjustifiable. So it's pretty unequivocal, doesn't it? And indeed I have to say that when that was announced, like everybody else in Derry, I was a bit swept away by it. I thought this is terrific. It was only when you got down to the detail and you sat down and read the report afterwards that you saw what they were doing. When they said, as Kate mentioned, they said, all this was done by one undisciplined officer and nine rogue soldiers. Nobody else bore any responsibility. Well, you see, the cover-up that Kate mentioned was what went out, the document that went out to every British embassy and consulate in the world within 24 hours of Bloody Sunday, identifying the places where people were shot and saying, this was a gunman, this was a nail palmer. He was fired and died, the statements from soldiers and all the rest of it. The complete hover-up. It was all based, all based on documents produced by a man called Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was the second in command of the 1st Battalion of the Parachute Regiment in the bog side during the shootings on Bloody Sunday. He was standing in Rossville Street where I was born. He was standing in Rossville Street as the shooting went on around him. He appeared in the tribunal and said he never noticed it. He never noticed it happening. More than a hundred shots fired. 28 people struck by bullets. 13 dead on the day and another going to die starting on a couple, a couple of months later. Michael Jackson said he didn't see any of it. He couldn't help the tribunal. It subsequently emerged that Michael Jackson had written out what was called the Jackson shortlist. Shortlist. I mean, I won't go have time to go into it in sufficient detail, but this was a document with a map, sort of with eight figure uh, a reference points, whatever you call it. Sort of on the map, identifying where every soldier who was shot was standing and identifying exactly where the people hit by bullets were standing at, a, at the time. One of the problems with this was that when you took the map and drew lines between where the soldier was supposed to be and the victim was supposed to be, an awful lot of the shots went through brick buildings. It couldn't have happened the way that they said. What is more, the positions that they were put in and not a single case, the positions were identified in the map, conform to the places where the soldiers giving evidence had said they were standing. It was all made up. It was made up by Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson gave evidence that he sat in the back of a Land Rover, but it's got Florence Avenue a couple of hundred yards from where the killings had taken place. He sat there at night, there was a light or a kerosene lamp or something, so I had him sit sort of with a map, sort of on his knees, a bit of paper, and write all this to all the soldiers who had fired came to talk to him, gave them a statement that he wrote it all down. Now, he gave this evidence after all the soldiers had given evidence. None of them had remembered this business of going and telling Colonel Jackson sort of where they had been. Sort of this scene was supposed to be quite memorable. You know, so a lot of people just killed. So the shooting's right over and they're standing there giving their accounts at the back of a Land Rover. You'd think you would remember something like that, wouldn't you? Particularly if you were one of the people who had fired the shot. Not one of them, not one of them. Remembered it. Michael Jackson was co conducted the cover up. The significant thing about Michael Jackson is this Michael Jackson went on to become, he was promoted and became a very distinguished soldier, at least a very senior soldier. He was subsequently the commander of the uh, Parisian Regiment. He was then sort of the uh, NATO commander in Bosnia. He was the commander of the British Army of the Rhine. So, and eventually, eventually, in 2003, he became the chief of the general staff. Britain's number one top soldier. Now you see, if the Savile Tribunal had pointed the finger at him and said, there's the guy who organised the cover-up, as they should have done on the basis of the evidence, if they had said that about Michael Jackson, David Cameron could not have stood up in the Commons and said, this is unjustified and unjustifiable, and what is more, the Chief of the General Staff of the British Army was involved. Instead, he was able, he thought, to stand up and say that all this had happened, but it was only rogue soldiers who did it. That there's no, there's no stain, he said, on the reputation of the British uh, uh, Army. There's no stain on the reputation of the parachute regiment. It was only these crazy, undisciplined people who had done it. Now, I'll tell you a wee story. If I tell you a wee story, I do. Uh, uh. <laughs> 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 Michael Jackson I mentioned <coughs> these things happen everywhere. They're part of the capitalist society. They're part of the society in which there's imperialism, sort of in which people are ground down and nations are uh, 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 oppressed and individuals are oppressed and uh, all the rest of it. Uh, it, it, it. The story of Michael Jackson, and uh, bloody Sunday, Michael Jackson's rise to be the number one soldier, is strikingly similar to that of a man called Conan Poyle. 
Now, these people of a certain age might remember Colin Powell. Oh, no, he, he was the chief of yeah. the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States. I, uh, you know, sir, under, who was he under? Who was he under Reagan? Bush. Bush. Hey, Bush, Bush, you're absolutely Bush, right. I mixed them up. There's Reagan and Nixon and Bush, and it was so hard to keep track of them. <laughs> uh, but they, they, like Colin Powell, sir, when the day of the My Lai massacre in Vietnam, sir, an ordinary, the incident of My Lai massacre is memorable for a number of reasons, and one is, it should be mentioned, that it, it stopped the shooting of people after 300 were dead, ended when an American helicopter landed. So when the pilot got out with two other people, two other soldiers, and ordered them to point their guns at the other soldiers who were killing innocent Vietnamese, and told them, if you keep shooting, we we'll shoot you. There's only three of them, and about 15 other soldiers involved. There's decency everywhere when you look for it. So there is hum humanity sort of triumphs over all that awesome. hatred. Or everywhere that you look. But that guy, the helicopter pilot, went to Saigon immediately afterwards. Went to the army headquarters and said he wanted to report a war crime carried out by soldiers. He did actually see the man Major Colin Powell was the man he was directed to. Colin Powell organized the cover-up of the My Lai Massacre. General Jackson organized the cover-up of Bloody Sunday. It often occurred to me, sort of, when we met them later years, did they chuckle over the fact that they had managed this on behalf of their respective states. You see, some people might say, well, how you mean, isn't that terrible, sort of, that, that those guys were chosen for this rapid promotion right to the top? It's because they had covered up murder that they were promoted. It's because they had done the state that service that they were promoted. And it's important to remember that, because what it tells us, these people are unrepentant. They're absolutely unrepentant. Insofar as they give way under pressure, it's because they have to. And when they do, you sort of not pressure from a campaign put on. They will give away as little as possible and protect the upper echelons insofar as they, uh, uh, as they can. That's what they're doing in all these cases. That's what they do all the time. And the reason they do it is that they preside over a, a system based upon lives. It's all lives. I mean, some people said it after that referendum across the water, you know, that Boris Johnson and people lied and lied and told terrible lies, sort of, about what would happen, sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of after Brexit and all that there. Why should we be surprised? Of course they lied. They lied, sort of, they opened their mouths, the lies come out. No, they lied during elections. They lied here. They did anybody say, come along here and say, vote for us and we'll oppose austerity on you? No, they did not. They lie all the time. It's part of that. And they lie all the time because they pretend to be running a democratic system which people have equal rights, which protects the human rights of citizens. That's part of the compact which they make to our worst society. And of course they don't. They don't. They don't represent the people at all. And it's because the entire system is based upon uh, life. And when it comes to things like Bloody Sunday, they come to Hillsborough, they come to the Craig Avon too, when it comes to the Stardust, when it comes to all these things, all that we, it, that's happening is that their lives are dramatized. And they're dramatized and made emotional. Therefore, we can actually see them in operation. But the point that I'm making, it will take me more than 10 seconds, really sorry, sorry for that, <laughs> is that the, the, the way to, in order to get to stop the lies being told about people brutalized and bereaved by the state, in order to stop the lies being told, we have to put an end to the system which depends on lies to maintain its plausibility and to keep the operation going. Smash the system and we get the truth. Yeah, nothing to do with his gender. Absolutely nothing to do with his gender. Um, listen, folks, we have to empty the hall. Can we give a big round of applause to these very kind?